Good morning, everyone. If everyone could just move up a little bit, if, if you would please, so that we can uh, have a little bit of a closer uh, audience, if you don't mind. We don't, we don't bite. <laughs> Give folks a few more minutes to trickle down from the ballroom and then we'll begin. And again, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for this very interesting panel, Sustainability at the Nexus of Food, Energy, Water, Climate, and Health. We have some pretty incredible panelists uh, that have joined us this morning. I'll first introduce myself as well as my co-moderator. My name is Amy Sapkota, and I am a professor of applied environmental health here at the University of Maryland School of Public Health. And I also direct our Conserve Center of Excellence, which is funded by the USDA National Institute for Food and Agriculture. I'd also like to introduce my co-moderator, Bill Piermite. Bill is the managing director of our environmental law program at the University of Maryland Carey School of Law. So before we hear from our fabulous speakers, I just wanted to frame the issues uh, just over a few minutes. So bear with me, and I'll get my slide. So as you can see from the title of the session, we are covering many broad issues related to food, water, energy, climate, and health. So how do all these issues fit together? So I thought I would frame our session by first introducing you to the idea of the food, energy, water nexus for those of you who may not be familiar with it. So out of everyone in the audience, who has heard of the food, energy, water nexus? Okay, so it's about half and half. Okay, so the, it's, it's a fairly new concept or paradigm, but basically what we're talking about here is that we know that our food, our energy, and our water systems are very interrelated and interconnected. And as we move forward in time and we continue to see very heavy stresses on all of those systems, as we develop solutions to address these stressors, we need to think about all of the systems together. We can't just think of a water solution without thinking of the food and energy con component because they will all impact each other. So if we look just to the very close future of 2030, which is not so far away, we see that we do have increasing demands on each of these systems. So it's estimated that our demand for fresh, fresh water will increase by 40%. Our demand for food by 35, and some estimates are saying up to 70%. And our demand for energy will increase by around 50%. And a lot of this is due to factors like population growth, increased urbanization, increased expansion of the westernized lifestyle, the increasing expansion of the middle class, a lot of factors. And then if we look at the interconnectedness of these systems, just as an example, there's lots of ways to look at this puzzle, but if we start with food production, everywhere along the food production pathway, from the pre-harvest setting to cooking in our kitchens, requires a lot of water and requires a lot of energy. And along that pathway, we're also producing greenhouse gases at every step. And of course, as we all know, as we produce more greenhouse gases, we are causing increased disturbances to our climate. When we see increasing climate variability and climate change, we are seeing direct human health impacts as well, which we'll talk about during the session. So you can see, this is why we need to begin to, to come at these issues from a very interdisciplinary manner, bring diverse disciplines together, to create uh, solutions that will address each aspect of these issues. 
So before I introduce our first panelists, I did want to highlight some of the ongoing programs here at the School of Public Health by which we are addressing these issues. So the first is our Conserve Center of Excellence. As I mentioned, it's funded by US, uh, the USDA. And Conserve is very interdisciplinary, drawing from faculty and staff and students from the School of Public Health, the College of Ag, the School of Public Policy, the College of Engineering, and many other groups on campus and at nine other institutions. And with Conserve, we are addressing the issue that we're running out of fresh water to grow our food, both in this country and in many countries of the world. So what Conserve is doing is we are facilitating the adoption of successful water reuse solutions that can enable food production to thrive in our changing climate. In addition to Conserve, we were recently funded by the National Science Foundation last year to launch our new University of Maryland Global Stewards graduate training program. This is also a very interdisciplinary program targeted at graduate students, doctoral students, across all of our colleges and schools on the campus. And the idea of this program is that we're, change, we're, we're training our next generation of change makers at the Food Energy Water Nexus. So with that, I would now like to uh, go ahead and introduce our first speaker. First, I will set up his slide deck. And uh, just as an aside, we will have four talks. They'll be very short talks, and I'd like you to hold your questions until after all of the talks have been completed so we have time for a discussion. So at this point, I am very delighted to introduce Dr. Amir Sapkota, who is an associate professor in applied environmental health here at the University of Maryland School of Public Health. He is also the director of our Exposome Small Molecule Core Facility, and he will be talking about some of his work looking at the impacts of climate change on human health. All right, good morning everyone and uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so the title of my presentation is Too Little or Too Much Water, the, the, the implications sort of for food security and infectious diseases in changing climate. But before I start talking about that, I just want to bring your attention to some key definition and, and that is when we're talking about climate, we are really talking about aggregate pattern of weather. Okay, and the thing that you hear most about is the global temperature, but there are many other things, including, you know, rainfall or timing of monsoon onset, right? Or, or uh, a sea ice coverage, the timing of snowfall, amount of uh, snowfall, and, and so on and so forth. But when you look at any of these elements together over a long period of time, sort of a pattern starts to emerge. Okay, so we have average value, and then some years you get more, and other years you get less, right? Uh, and under changing climate, one scenario is that the average shifts. Okay, so you have changes in the average. Under another scenario, the average actually remains the same, but you get more erratic uh, pattern on the tail end of the distribution, right? So you may get a lot of heavy precip precipitation one year, maybe drought in the other. Right or or a lot lot of cold days and a lot of heat days and, and, and di di different times right um, so this is sort of like you know if you happen to go to your office one day you know uh, one day and you are two uh, two hour early and another day you are two hour late on average you are right on right on time <laughs> but if you talk about you know like uh, your colleagues and your uh, supervisor's perception of that, I mean, they may have a very, uh, you know, different view of it, right? So, and then the third scenario is where both the average and the variance is increasing, okay? So, so it's a combination of those both. So I'm going to give you an example of two, I'm going to talk about two different examples and give, uh, talk about a drought and its impact on food insecurity in Nepal and then the other example that I'm going to give about, uh, is, is too much rain, too much water, in this case, extreme precipitation and increased risk of food and waterborne illnesses right here uh, in, in our uh, state of Maryland. So talking about Nepal, right? So uh, as you all probably know, Nepal is a landlocked country. The entire northern part of Nepal is filled with very tall, uh, 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 mesmerizing mountains. In fact, everybody in Nepal gets to have a mountain name after them, um, right? So, so uh, as far as water is concerned, no, Nepal should not have to worry about water, 
Uh, but the challenge is the uh, mountains and the glacier fed rivers are over there, agriculture is happening over there, population center is right down there, right, and on a whole different part. And, and it requires energy and incredible infrastructure to get that water from where it is to agricultural field and onto the population center. And that is something Nepal lacks terribly, okay? So we have drought, you know, uh, when you have drought, agriculture suffers tremendously because all agriculture in Nepal is basically relying on monsoon rainfall. Okay, so when a drought happens, you have situation like this, and in fact, people queuing up for water, drinking water uh, uh, for, for hours at a time, and that's their container, water container, where people get water from those municipal, you know, uh, system because there's a lack of, you know, like uh, adequate infrastructure for wa water supply into the household. So, but this sort of, uh, you know, risk factor does not exist in vacuum. Okay, there are other things that are in play. Uh, and one example that I would like to give you is, is this interaction with this disaster as a risk factor, okay? So this is an example of the most recent earthquake that hit Nepal in 2015. Tremendous loss of life as well as property and, uh, uh, and infrastructure and so forth. So one of the things that uh, uh, my postdoc and I, uh, Dr. Heather Rendell, was interested in is understanding to what extent food insecurity related to monsoon anomaly in Nepal is exacerbated by natural disaster, right? So we wanted to look at the interaction between those two. And, and to do that, we used uh, the demographic health survey data for Nepal for 2016. And we had uh, climate data from SeaWorld uh, uh, for this 30-kilometer uh, gridded uh, uh, clim climate data uh, from 1980 to 2015. Um, and this uh, figure right here shows the, the uh, survey, the DHA survey cluster, and also the district that were affected by earthquake. Okay, so this is what you're looking at. And this figure right here shows the same thing. And in this case, the uh, DHA survey cluster are categorized into rainfall anomaly. Okay, so uh, we, we look at the G, uh, rainfall, uh, rainfall G score. So the red ones are where there's a severe uh, drought, so, uh, so to speak, right? So in this year, there were a lot of droughts. And the green area is sort of where the uh, rainfall anomaly is more on the positive side, so you have more rainfall compared to what your norm, right? So, so your overall average. So what did we find? Um, so I want to bring your attention to this uh, gra uh, figure here. So on the y-axis, you are looking at predicted probability of moderate to severe food insecurity. Right? So, so probability of food insecurity. So higher the value, worse off you are. And on the x-axis is we have the rainfall G score. Okay, so this is rainfall, the normal is zero right here, and these are a drier, like negative three is like much drier, and, and this is positive, is like you know, positive anomaly. So, and the other thing that I want to bring uh, your attention is this black one is the district that were not affected by hurricane, I mean the earthquake, and this uh, orange one are the districts that are affected by earthquake. So what is happening in this case? Well, in, in those districts that are not impacted by earthquake, you see the, the food insecurity getting worse as the drought increases, right? And it improves as the, 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 the precipitation uh, increases, okay? But we saw like this completely different relationship among the districts that were heavily impacted by earthquake. So in those situations, what happens is drought actually seems to, uh, you know, alleviate food insecurity, right? And then it gets worse off as the, the, the precipitation increases, actually, the, 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 the you know, drought improves. So what on earth is happening? So this was a little bit surprising. We were not anticipating that. We thought the, the level would be much higher on, 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 on this curve, uh, the district that are impacted by uh, uh, the earthquake. Well, what happened is after the earthquake, Nepal received tremendous amount of food aid, okay? So this food aid actually went on to improve food insecurity in the district that was impacted by earthquake, okay? But what happened is that those food aid had to be delivered from roads like this, okay? And then you see this is ground is severely compromised uh, by the earthquake. So as the, the rainfall start, 
you know, this sort of like thing, this entire roads were wiped away because of a landslide. In fact, that particular year in Nepal, the, the, the rate of landslide was almost 10 to 15 times higher than what is norm. Okay, so, so this really then disrupted. So when the, precipit the, the rainfall uh, uh, arrived, increased, uh, this disrupted the delivery of those food aid. And I think that's what's happening. And that's what we are seeing, that strange relationship. But I do want to uh, you know, uh, take the next couple of minutes to talk about uh, uh, situation right here in uh, Maryland, and that is like too much rainfall and how it's impacting uh, foodborne illnesses, right? So I want to start with some of this newspaper headline right here uh, from 2012, Washington Post. Uh, the rainfall uh, that hit around BWI area is again, it's, it's a once in a thousand year event. Okay, let me see. Two years later, uh, USA Today, another headline, rain that hit the same area once in a thousand year event again. This is past this May 2018, same exact area. And now actually it's a Fox News saying that was a once in a thousand year event and um, a Republican governor of uh, Maryland acknowledging this. So we, want, we know that this kind of extreme event is becoming more frequent, more intense and longer lasting and what our climate scientists tell us is that this trend will continue into the foreseeable future in response to changing climate. So what is happening? Like, uh, so we wanted to know how that impacts health. So we were interested in looking at diarrheal diseases in Maryland. So we did precisely that. And what we see is that the, the, the risk of diarrheal diseases, in this case we're talking about salmonellosis, right? Salmonellosis goes up significantly uh, as a function of that extreme precipitation event, okay? And what was really interesting is that that risk is not uniform across state of Maryland, in that the coastal areas experience much higher uh, uh, rate of risk to, uh, you know, uh, salmonellosis risk in, in response to those extreme events compared to inland communities. Right, so, so this is the first time we were able to actually show that this sort of extreme event actually differentially impacts our coastal communities. A lot of work has, a lot of people have been talking about how coastal communities are increased risk primarily from sea level rise, but this was the first time we actually showed quantitative data how that risk differs among this community, like the health data. Uh, so sort of like to uh, synthesize, uh, you know, so what we are seeing, and this is, uh, I guess, not uh, surprising, is that, uh, you know, either too little or too much water that can both impact health and food insecurity, right? So uh, gold, uh, goldy, uh, deja vu Goldilocks all over here, right? Uh, but I do want to bring your attention, like, ab about this notion of interaction of risk factors and how that determines population vulnerability. As we are moving forward, we need to, as a public health community, start thinking about our uh, adaptation strategies, right? So given that these extreme events are going to be there with us in the uh, foreseeable future, how do we as a community adapt to that so we can actually minimize those risks? Um, so this is really, really critical. Um, and I also want to bring your attention to the, the need for sub-seasonal to seasonal forecast. Because I've been to many communities and talked with the, the, the health, uh, public health practitioners. Nobody, nobody, you know, talks about 2100. 2100 IPCC, like that, that drives the, all the climate forecasts are driven by IPCC, and, and we talk about 2100, right? But public health professionals, we don't talk about 2100. They do care about what's happening tomorrow. They do care about what's happening next season, next year, or maybe year after. So there's really, this is where the gap is, is, is that we don't have the forecast for those, you know, like sub-seasonal to seasonal outlook. And that's what we need. And this is because that helps. That helps to protect health and prevent disease and death. Um, with that, I think I will just step. Uh, all right. Wow. Nice. <laughs> And we'll have a, please hold your questions for, for later.
And at this point in time, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Ronnie Neff. Ronnie is an assistant professor and program director of food system sustainability and public health program at the Center for a Livable Future at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Thank you. I'm really happy to have the chance to come here and talk with you. Um, I'm going to talk about wasted food and how it connects to climate change and public health. And these are just some images from the Sustainable Development Goals. Sustainable Development 12.3 over here is that we should cut waste of food in half globally. And the United States has also signed on to a similar goal, as have many um, cities and um, localities. Um, and wasted food connects to um, obviously good health and well-being, but it connects to a lot of the other sustainable development goals as well. And I'll also talk about the food, energy, water nexus. I'm here, as was mentioned, from the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future. And we are just down the road in Baltimore. And there's so many intersections between our work. So I'm really happy to be here and hope to um, foster more interconnections and um, working relationships. Um, we focus on food systems and public health. And we have a number of education programs related to this topic. And as this was mentioned, um, I direct a program focused on sustainability. OK, so let me take this into climate change. Um, this is some research that was done a few years ago, not by me, but it's very, it, it demonstrates why we need, one of the reasons why we need to focus on wasted food. So here are the agricultural greenhouse gas emissions in 2010. And this lighter orange bar is emissions from every other sector. Um, industry, transport, buildings, energy, et cetera. Here's a business as usual scenario of agricultural greenhouse gas emissions in 2050. So that line is the budget, the threshold, the total amount of emissions that we can emit in order to stick to the Paris Agreement um, to keep us to two degrees centigrade. And you can see the, almost the entire budget is used by agriculture. There's no space for any other industry in there. But if we eat 75% less meat and dairy and then cut waste of food in half, we reduce agricultural emissions, create some space for all the other sectors. Now, um, it's quite challenging to reduce meat and dairy consumption that far, particularly since in many areas of the world they're going to need to increase as populations grow and as nutrition improves. Um, waste of food is basically its greenhouse gas emissions and its resources, its food, energy, water in the landfill. I mean, it's, it's something that um, it just doesn't need to exist, uh, or it needs to exist a little bit, but it doesn't need to exist to the extent that it does. So in the United States, Globally, we waste about 30% of our food. And if wasted food globally was a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter after the United States and China. In the United States, we waste about 40% of our food supply. Just kind of wrap your head around that for a minute. Um, and that's a 50% increase since the 1970s. And almost all that goes into the landfill. Um, a small percent goes, is recycled in various ways. Um, and when it's in the landfill, it's emitting methane. And then the food production itself is a greenhouse gas um, emitter. So, so that's why the greenhouse gas footprint is so high. And of the food that's wasted, most of it has something to do with consumers, either coming from consumers themselves or from consumer-facing businesses. So that means there's a lot that we could do. And there's a lot that industry can do to help us do better. Consumer-facing businesses is like retail restaurants and so on. So we did a study in 2015, and we wanted to understand why consumers are discarding food. And the number one and number two reasons really spoke to me as a public health person, because this is public health. Number one is they're concerned about food poisoning. Number two is they're concerned they want their food to be fresh. And we know that a lot of that is actually unnecessary. People have a lot, like, they're, they're overly precautionary. They're misunderstanding date labels. And then they, they have this idea that food doesn't taste good unless it's like at its peak of freshness. Whereas actually, if you're cooking it and other things, it'll be fine for quite a while afterwards, um, particularly foods that are not uh, perishables. So one of the things that we wanted to understand is because so many of these foods that we're throwing out are perishable foods, how much nutritional value is lost? The previous estimates are that we're throwing out about 12, 1250 to 1400 calories per capita per day in the United States. Um, but since 
the, the foods that we're throwing out the most are relatively low calorie, we're thinking, well, we're throwing out a lot of other nutrition um, along with that, um, including a lot of under-consumed nutrients. So this is a study that we did. Um, Maurice Spiker is a doctoral student in the School of Public Health and a nutritionist, and um, we worked closely together on this, and she did a lot of the analyses. So what we did is we looked at um, the USDA, and one of the co-authors was also from the USDA. We looked at the USDA data, um, and we matched that to um, data on nutritional availability. And then we looked at um, how much of each food was wasted, what's the nutrient composition of each food, and then what's the nutritional value. Um, and here's just a few of the sample results. So if you, the um, light gray is, is retail level and the darker gray is actual consumers. So each day we waste the equivalent of 5.9 grams of dietary fiber per capita, um, which is the equivalent of 19% of a nutrient day of dietary fiber. Um, looked at, and that's per person, or looked at across the entire population, each day we waste enough dietary fiber to eat the, meet the RDA for 74 million women or 48 million men, um, which is about 27% of the U.S. adult population. Now, one important caveat to all this is that um, we can't actually recover all the food, and so it's really important to think of this in a nuanced way. First of all, a lot of the food is not necessarily safe or of decent quality by the time that it's wasted, although we want to use prevention, so we want to prevent it from getting there. Second of all, um, there's, a, cost, there's a, a limit of cost effectiveness of food recovery when, it, when there's no longer a benefit um, to recover every last droplet. And then the third thing is that um, we want to have some excess food in our system because we want to have a buffer in case of emergencies. So just to briefly summarize some strengths and limitations, um, this was the first study to um, bring together these kinds of databases to look um, and, and do this kind of nutritional assessment in wasted food. Um, and a key limitation is that we looked at 213 commodities where the data is available, but there are other foods that aren't included. Um, and some foods may change in their nutrient composition by the time that they are discarded. So this is one of those public health studies that um, really captured a lot of the public imagination. And that's one of the things that I like about doing this research because um, there's so much interest in it, and um, something about those numbers was very compelling. We got a BuzzFeed video um, based on it. Um, this, they, they summarized it, and of course, we were talking about um, under-consumed nutrients. They only talked about calories, but um, if rec Americans recovered all food, the discarded food would be enough to feed 190 million adults. That's 84% of the U.S.'s 20, 226 million adult population. Still pretty dramatic. How much food do you waste? which I love this because I'm not sure how that's waste unless it's like he didn't eat it because he didn't lick it off his face. But <laughs> so we took this method and we've applied it in several other ways. Here's our wasted seafood project. So um, we know from the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, we should be eating three times as much seafood as we currently eat. Um, and it's not really clear where all that fish is going to come from. Um, we know that, that global fish harvests have peaked and we know that like aquaculture is now half of our seafood supply, but that uses a lot of uh, energy and water and resources. So we pulled together all the available data that we could find, and we estimated that up to 47% of our seafood supply is currently wasted. And if you put that in terms of, um, again, nutritional value, that's the equivalent of 9.5 million men's protein years or 18.5 million adult omega-3 fatty acid years. Um, and so look, there needs to be a lot more work on this. So this actually led into a four-year project that we're working on, um, looking at the seafood energy water nexus um, to really dig in and understand more about what's going on and what we can do about it. We also did something similar looking at um, farm-level waste, looking at um, vegetables and berries in Vermont. And um, we found that basically um, we just at the farm level, just in Vermont, there's enough salvageable vegetables and berries to fill the nutritional, the nutrient gap for um, 221,000 women for vitamin A. Okay, so let me just talk briefly about some broader implications here. Um, clearly, we waste substantial amounts of nutrients, including many that are under consumed at the retail consumer and farm level. 
Um, food recovery is not the only answer to waste of food. It's not the answer to food insecurity. So if we want to reduce waste of food, we should stop, start at the top and look at prevention. If we want to address food insecurity, let's address poverty. But if we want to um, find something that pulls together a lot of different benefits at once, addressing wasted food is key. Um, it, it, it can um, increase our nutrient availability. It can um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It makes those resources available for human consumption. Um, so I'd like to thank you, and thanks to the organizers for bringing me here. And um, I'll be interested to hear your questions later. All right, so our next speaker is Professor Nathan Holtman. He's an associate professor uh, here at the University of Maryland and the director of the Center for Global Sustainability in the School of Public Policy. So without further ado, please, Professor Holtman. Great, well thank you, uh, Amy and Bill, for inviting me to be the, on the panel, uh, also the School of Public Health, for pulling this uh, great conference it's great to have a chance to, to uh, talk across different disciplines and learn about what you all are doing as well. Um, I also want to thank Amy for her leadership here on campus, uh, th helping us think about this food, energy, water nexus and think about different ways we can do that, not only as a, uh, a campus community, but also in a broader community tied into uh, policy and, and, and broader communities around the world. Um, so one, one of the defining features, I think, is, is uh, Professor Sapkota Amy Sapkota said at the very beginning, uh, is that it's sort of helping us think differently about the cross linkages between some of the problems that many of us have worked on uh, kind of in isolation in some ways in the past, thinking differently about ways to solve sustainability and health challenges in an integrated way. Um, and, and that's a concept, by the way, Professor Neff mentioned, it's embedded in the 17 sustainable development goals that world leaders have negotiated and, and decided on a couple of years back that continue to animate and inform the way global leaders uh, across the world are thinking about solving development and sustainability challenges simultaneously, looking at these as not in isolation but in conversation with each other. Um, a challenge of that is, is how we conceive and implement those actual policies, right? It's not easy to do the, the policy development and deployment and implementation that speaks to and answers some of the problems that even we've already seen uh, uh, in the two previous presentations. Uh, and that's maybe, that's kind of what I'm bringing to the, the panel today a, a bit. I'm approaching this from a slightly different angle. Uh, I'm not a, uh, a health specialist, I'm a climate person, but I think that one thing we're doing today in this panel is starting that conversation or continuing the conversation of how we learn from each other and how we do things in an integrated way. So my story today, it's a short story, it's only 12 minutes, uh, <laughs> but my story today is about how we have uh, sort of doing some work that I've been involved in have started to think about this uh, in, in the context of climate and how, to, how this story is rooted in solving problems in whatever way you can. I think that's the bottom line. In whatever way you can today in the organizations that you are part of, whatever work you have access to, is to thinking about solving those problems in whatever way you can and then integrate that with other people that are working similarly on different topics but that might be resonant. Um, so, so the story I'm telling you today is about climate. Uh, about climate change and climate policy. And um, all of you, well, many of you are Americans, and some of you might be guests from, from other countries, um, but, but uh, many of us are resident here and we kind of know the story. Um, climate change, of course, is an issue. I'm actually not gonna talk in any way about 
the importance of addressing climate, I'm just going to take it as a given, and we can uh, take it offline if, you're, if you want to argue with me about that. Let's do it later. But I'm just going to assert that there's a really uh, essential and important uh, element of our action on climate change today, and even in the next, essentially, decade, to get us on that pathway that we heard about earlier toward a 2.2 degrees Celsius trajectory or even a 1.5, which is what we know we need to do to minimize the risks of climate change to human societies around the world. But here in the US, we've taken a different path from the federal government. Now, I worked in the federal government in the White House before the previous administration, so you probably know where I come out on this uh, on the spectrum. But, um, but basically, the current administration has made a different decision about how we're approaching climate change as a country. Uh, at, at the federal level, and really to be to be direct, that that's essentially disengagement or, or anti-engagement, however you want to call it. Um, and what that's meant is that there's been a leadership vacuum at the top level in the United States, the world's second largest emitter, um, and 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 uh, and that's had repercussions for global ambition uh, on climate change as well. So within. 72 hours of our current president's announcement he was going to withdraw the United States from the Paris Agreement, a coalition of actors, at that point 2,500 strong, of cities, states, businesses, universities, communities of faith, tribal groups, and many, many others, got together and said, we are still in, we are going to work toward the goals of climate change in the Paris Agreement, and try to do so in ways that sort of ma maximize our sort of benefits for our jurisdictions. We're doing this because we want to. And that's an important part of the story I'm going to tell you today. So this map didn't really come out because some of the light colors don't come out on this projector. But what you can see on the left is this story of all of the actors who have said, we are going to still work for, in the context of our organizations, our jurisdictions, our constituencies, our citizens, are going to work for action on climate, energy, and sustainability broadly. And that's where we're starting the story today. We've got all these dots, which are different kinds of organizations. It's not important today what they are. But they're states, cities, businesses, et cetera, and a few of the kind of organizing coalitions listed on the right. Again, happy to talk about this later. But the upshot <laughs> is that this was a groundswell of activity after this top-level announcement from the federal government to withdraw from the process entirely. So what happened was from the bottom up, all of these organizations joined together and said, we are going to do something about it. Now, interestingly, that number is now 3,500, 3,600, something like that. That's important, that's exciting, but that's not the most exciting thing about it. Another element of this story, I should, no, before I talk about Jerry Brown and Michael Bloomberg, another, another important element of this story is that these organizations are working in a federal system and across boundaries, right? So the question really becomes, what does that actually add up to? And that's where we get to our story. Uh, I have two people here showing you the former governor of California, Jerry Brown, and also Michael Bloomberg, who's well known to, of course, Professor Neff, uh, the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, both of them jumped into this fray and said, we want to help understand what these organizations can do together and to help us think about creatively what we can do more beyond what's already been pledged. And so I've been working as, as part of our, our center. We, we are the research co-leads for this uh, America's Pledge effort, and we're the lead on the report that came out last year, and we're working on another one this year to actually quantify and understand how these organizations are working together and what they add up to. And what's interesting here is that not only is that a large number of dots on the page, but you can't see it on this figure because it's completely gone. But let me tell you the upshot. That set of coalitions is equivalent to the world's third largest economy and the world's fourth largest greenhouse gas emitter, so right behind food, um, food waste, sorry. Um, so, so that coalition is globally significant. And the, the question is, even beyond that, well, what can it add up to? I'm going to show you the, the brief story now. You can look it up online. Good. I'm, you can look it up online. It's America's Pledge on, on, America's Pledge on Climate.com. You can read the report. And what we're showing is that, actually, the coalition of city, states, businesses, and more already are, are driving down our emissions in this country, despite what would otherwise have been a 3% increase by 2025, uh, thanks to the kind of withdrawal of the federal government, to something like a 17% decrease. And with additional actions, which I won't go into today, um, that, set of, that set of actors, using the policy levers that they have accessible to them today, 
We don't have to wait for the next election, but today, those actors have the ability to drive emissions down even further. And we worked, it wasn't just a research project, we worked across different st constituent groups, stakeholder groups, to better understand what kinds of actions they would like to implement, and then we helped understand where those, where those actions would actually drive the overall U.S. emissions trajectory. Now, this is one metric of sustainability, but the U.S. emissions trajectory by 2025 uh, and beyond. Um, now, this next year, we're going to be doing that, but we're also going to be thinking about what it might look like to have a federal reengagement. In other words, a comprehensive American climate policy that integrates across all the actor groups already up to the federal government. So we'll see what happens. Uh, stay tuned for that. Um, one quick note I'm, I'm going to actually show you just very briefly here. Um, as we're thinking about I, I don't want to spend too much time on it. But basically what this is showing you is the different kinds of reductions you get across different sectors. And I, re I wanted to show you this not because of the technical detail, but because I wanted to kind of flag out when we're thinking about the food, energy, water nexus, it's important to think in a sectoral way, to think about not only the specific actors you're talking about, but what sectors they're in and how do you speak to them, how do you work with them. And a couple of, that I just flag is, this one is natural lands and agriculture. And then on the far left, you see a couple of power uh, the power-related ones in buildings and industry. There are lots of ways we can get at this problem, a lot of ways that this touches on food, energy, and water. I don't have time to go into it, but the point is that there are many opportunities there, again, that exist today. We do not have to wait for the federal government, okay? In some ways, we can build this action by doing stuff in the organizations that we have access to, that we are part of uh, uh, already today. Um, so, that's basically the story I wanted to tell, okay? So that thinking about the challenge that we have on climate, what we were shown in the past couple of years is a story kind of grounded in a hardship. It's grounded in the fact that we lost federal leadership in this, in this moment. But it actually teaches us an important lesson, I think, of what we actually needed to do anyway in order to solve some of these cross-disciplinary integrated problems, which is that you address the problems at all of the levels that you can, in all of the organizations that you can, and you all out there, you are part of organizations right now. You are part of states, you are part of cities, you are part of other organizations, and you are going to be part of this story. And my invitation for you as we're thinking about this is how does this food, energy, water question you might be approaching it from a health perspective. You might be approaching it from a water perspective. How can we work across those different groups? How can we speak to others with similar interests but have maybe been doing using different toolkits to actually solve those problems in the constituencies in which we're grounded today? So that's kind of where I'd like to leave it. I have a couple of final thoughts here. Um, but basically, the overall thought here is that the diverse bottom-up efforts of actors in the real economy, in other words, regular people, just like you and me, you know, just kind of we work in our own institutions, our own organizations. That's the way we will solve some of these problems. I am completely convinced of that. That's the only way we're going to be doing it in the rapid way that we know we need to do in the next few years. Um, these coalitions uh, that we're talking about need to be grounded in analytical approaches. And that's where our jobs as certainly panelists, but your jobs as as experts who are thinking about these, these, these areas, either in the course of your education or in your research expertise that you're bringing to these problems, we need to work across those groups to help the people who are decision makers make decisions that incorporate some of the information and input that we can generate out of the research enterprise. And then finally, I mean, I think this is embedded in my talk overall, but these new models of collaboration are going to be key to realizing this potential. So, that's it. I've, I just want to say thank you, everybody, and we'll take questions, I guess, later Q&A. All right, thank you. All right, so certainly, uh, last but not least, is Professor Sarah Everhart, um, who is a research associate and legal specialist for the Agricultural Law Education Initiative uh, at the University of Maryland Carey School of Law up the road in Baltimore. So, Professor Everhart, please. Thanks, Bill, and good morning, everyone. So, in case you've never heard of the Agriculture Law Education Initiative, we're actually a program that's made up of different parts of the University of Maryland. So, as Bill said, I work for the University of Maryland School of Law. 
Um, and we have lawyers, col my colleagues here at College Park, and we also have folks down at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. We are an Empowering the State program, um, so Empower provides us with funding that allows us to work together um, across the different universities. Our job is to provide legal education and research to farmers across the state. So my role here today is to talk about the food production part of this issue, um, and sustainable agriculture is a, a, trippy, a very tricky topic. Um, when I was invited to speak here today, I've been thinking about this a lot, um, and I like to approach things like this with why. Why is this important? Why do we care? Why are we talking about food production when we're talking about public health um, and climate change? All these issues are interrelated, as I think we've all mentioned today. We all care about this stuff. We all buy food, we all consume food every day. Um, and in a 2015 study done by the US Farmers and Ranchers Alliance of 1,000 consumers, um, they asked folks, what are your perceptions about farming and sustainability? 75% of folks said that they considered how food was grown or raised when they were at the grocery store. How many of you think about how food was grown or raised when you're at the grocery store? That's a lot. <laughs> That's a, I do too. Um, the problem is, is it's just not that simple because a lot of us are far removed from farming. So you might think about it, you might have questions about it, and we all know the labeling doesn't help because <laughs> there's a lot of labels. You see a label and it might say conventionally grown versus organically grown. It might be natural, 100% natural, um, local. What does it mean? What should we be spending our money on? Um, and so, to drill down on that a little bit, I think it's important to start with just talking about what is sustainable agriculture. So there is a federal definition of sustainable agriculture, and there's quite a few factors here, so stay with me. But basically, um, when we're talking about sustainable agriculture, it's a production method um, that's going to first satisfy our human food and fiber needs, because we're talking about today, we have real today fiber food and fiber needs and we have the projected needs that we're going to have to satisfy in the future. It's also a type of agriculture that's going to enhance environmental quality um, and protect those natural resources that we all hold dear but we, need, we know that agriculture can't happen without depending on those natural resources. It also involves making efficient use of some non-renewable resources um, and where appropriate using natural biological cycles. It's important to think about profitability when we're talking about sustainable agriculture. I made sure I used the word profitability in the title of my presentation because agriculture is a business just like every other business out there and in order for farmers to adopt these methods, it can't put their profitability at risk. We have to think about the quality of life for the farmers themselves and for rural economies as well. Um, and so this definition can be found um, in the federal code so I gave you that citation there in case you're interested. What do these practices really look like on the ground? Well, I'm going to talk about some of the environmental quality um, sustainable agriculture practices today. Most of the environmental quality focused sustainable agriculture practices, the point of them is to reduce negative impacts to air or water, improve soil health, or create wildlife habitats. Practices vary in popularity and in use across the country. Um, however, the good news is for us here in Maryland is that we're considered a national leader in sustainable agriculture practices. So I know, you know, um, sometimes folks don't think about Maryland necessarily as a big ag state. Um, we do have a very large agricultural sector here in the state and they think about farmers out in the Midwest. When those farmers from the Midwest come to Maryland, they're blown away by what Maryland farmers do, how much Maryland farmers um, care about sustainable practices, and uh, how many of our practices, uh, how many of our farmers are already using these practices on a day-to-day -day basis. Our most popular um, sustainable agriculture practice in Maryland is the cover crop program. Um, so in 2016-17, we had over 500,000 acres enrolled in our cover crop program. If you drive around the rural parts of the state right now, you don't see barren dirt fields. It's a rarity. You see fields that look green, that have some growth in them, and that those fields are planted with cover crops. If you drive from Maryland into Delaware or Maryland into Pennsylvania, you can really tell when you've left Maryland because the fields don't necessarily look green anymore if they're not planted with cover crops. 
Cover crops are widely recognized as one of the most cost-effective and environmentally sustainable ways that farmers can practice sustainable agriculture and reach those nutrient reduction goals that we need to reach in Maryland to protect water quality. How can we do this in Maryland? How come we're a national leader in the adoption of cover crops? Why are our farmers versus farmers in other state um, leading this effort? It's really because we have a state cover crop program. So farmers are, um, if they sign up for the program, if they're able to, um, if they're able to participate, they're given program payments that offset the costs associated with the cover crop program. Um, and this is a way that makes the entire system sustainable for farmers, is that they're given a payment to offset seed um, and labor costs, and then they're able to put these cover crops in during the winter. What do they do? They shield fields against erosion. So if those fields are planted, it's gonna be much less likely that that dirt is gonna be eroding off of the field. Um, and they're also going to importantly prevent nutrient loss and improve soil health. So the over 500,000 that were planted in the 2016-2017 season um, prevented millions of pounds of loss in nitrogen and phosphorus from reaching Maryland's waterways. So th this program is really serving a really important purpose. Another program, and it's interesting because all of those good things I just told you about cover crops are actually complemented when farmers use conservation tillage. So what is conservation tillage? It basically just means um, you're either tilling the soil a minimal amount or you could be tilling the soil none at all, which is called no-till, which I'll talk about in a minute too. About half of Maryland acres um, are farmed in a way that they either implement conservation tillage, minimal tillage, or no tillage. What does that mean? It basically means that in a no-till system, the farmers are limiting the soil disturbance and they're planting the crop directly into the residue of the existing crop. So if you're driving around a rural part of Maryland right now and you see fields that have corn stubble from last year, and you think, why is that corn stubble still in that field? Don't the farmers need to get rid of all that before they're gonna plant this spring? Not in a conservation tillage system. Um, if they're doing no-till, they plant right into it. If they're doing reduced tillage, um, they might till strips of it or till, you know, in a reduced way. And that's going to increase soil carbon sequestration. So that's going to help prevent some of those greenhouse gas issues we were just talking about. It's going to increase the water holding capacity of the soil. So we heard about the um, torrential rains we had last year. Um, and that is, you know, has a lot of impact on farmers, a very negative impact when we have that much rain. Practicing having cover crops and having reduced tillage is going to help a farmer be able to weather one of those events. Last thing, nutrient management planning. So farmers are required in Maryland, and this is again a unique thing in Maryland, to create and to follow a nutrient management plan. It's going to specify how much fertilizer they can use, how those nutrients can be applied, and it's going to prevent farmers from unintentionally um, having excess nutrients which are then going to impact waterways. Other sustainability issues extremely important to farmers, um, I don't have time to talk about today, but alternative energy on the farm, very popular in Maryland, a lot of farmers are interested in incorporating it, worker safety, wage and hour protections, um, and the general health of rural economies. Markets are driving the change here, so all of you, uh, many of you raised your hands and said you care about this stuff when you buy your food in the grocery store. Large food companies, are making these proclamations. We all see them on the back of our cereal boxes, our yogurt containers, the things that we buy. For example, General Mills has said that by 2020, next year, their goal is to sustainably source 100% of their top priority ingredients. How are farmers going to be able to reach those goals? How are they gonna be able to produce food that these big food companies want and that you all wanna buy because it says sustainably sourced on the label when you're standing in the aisle at the grocery store? Farmers have to be able to make these changes, and there's some support on the federal level, but not a huge amount. Um, a lot of people were pleased that the conservation programming in the last farm bill was renewed. Um, so farmers can get co cost share, um, which will defray the costs of installation of some practices. They can also get rental payments for taking acreage completely out of production. Um, but there's not a whole lot of incentives for farmers to do all of this. Why, you know, where is the motivation going to come from? Um, the good news is that 
Most farmers are naturally stewards of the land, and they're used to adapting. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a farmer who is going to say, I'm, I'm farming today the way my fa father farmed and the way my grandfather farmed. They're constantly changing their methods. They have new technologies, new equipment, and they're ready to change um, and listen to those market forces. The last thing I wanted to um, show you quickly was, I'm a lawyer, and I think it'd be better coming from a farmer. So this is a short video um, from a farmer in Kent County, Maryland, talking about sustainability. I enjoy farming. I enjoy the challenges with it. I like the risk of the commodity markets. I like the risk of the weather. and You kind of thrive on it. You get a dry year. It's not as much fun as a wet year, but it, it, it's enjoyable. It's a gamble every year. My name is Trey Hill. I'm a fourth generation uh, grain farmer in Rock Hall, Maryland. The farming business was started by my great grandfather. Since been passed on, we're currently transitioning from my father to myself now. He still works every day, but he's assuming less responsibility all the time as I pick it up. It's kind of a natural family progression that you see on a lot of farms. We grow corn, wheat, and soybeans. Uh, the wheat all goes for human consumption to Pennsylvania, goes to flour mills. A lot of the snack foods you eat, corn and the beans, primarily go to chicken feed consumption. Delmarva is where we have a huge concentration of chickens. A lot of the chickens that feed the Northeast Corridor are all uh, grown and fed here on the Delmarva. We're environmentally friendly. Our consumers are a lot closer to us, and I think this region is much more environmentally sensitive. We're not going organic. I agree with organic, but I don't think that it would feed the world. I don't see my farm transitioning to organic. I, I enjoy working with folks that are organic. However, the focus of my farming operation of Harborview Farms now is to become more sustainable. There's many, many loose interpretations of sustainable, but what that means to me is that I want to leave the land in as good as or better condition than when I started farming it. By land, I mean land, water, environment, etc. Looking out for the public good as well as my own good, but while maintaining profitability. I think that we're doing a good job of that by the different things that we've, we've done. Or One is to try and utilize our nutrients as best we can so that the crop takes up the nutrients, uses the nutrients, and then we harvest the grain that contains those nutrients to feed the chickens, which then end up feeding people with no-till or conservation tillage, which is one of the most basic measures. We've been doing it for probably 25 years. This area was one of the areas that pioneered it. The advent of commercial herbicides is what allowed us to do that. Without herbicides, you can't do minimum tillage because there's no way to kill the weeds without tilling the ground and turning them over. One thing that no-till does is it helps keep sediment runoff out of the water. It makes sense for us to do, but it also is helping, hopefully, make the water in the bay a cleaner place. We're doing a lot of things different with nutrients than we ever used to. Some are by mandate, some are voluntary. When my father, what we used to do was spread the fertilizer in the wintertime on frozen ground, and that was basic practice. Then we'd till all the ground, and you just kind of spread the same thing on all your ground to make sure that you, you could feed the crop. Now we take soil samples every year as part of a nutrient management plan, which kind of goes into the mandate portion of it. We determine how much fertilizer is needed, primarily nitrogen and phosphorus, which are the two that cause the algae blooms and the pollution in the water. From there, we figure out what the crop should grow, we figure out what it should need, and we put the, the fertilizer on accordingly. And then while the corn is growing, we actually come in at the time when the corn is, is kind of peaking at its amount of nutrient uptake. In other words, when the corn most needs nitrogen to, to utilize it efficiently and grow the most corn for that pound of nitrogen, we come in later and put that additional nitrogen on. There's an ebb and flow to the seasons. There's a, a rush time and a downtime, which I think that life, for me, having grown up that way, I enjoy it. I like working 90 hours a week for a couple months out of the year, six months out of the year, and then having some time where you don't. And it kind of gives you, it keeps life interesting. All right, that was a lot of ground to cover in a very short amount of time. Let's hear it again for our panelists. They were all great. Thank you so much.
So now I've been tasked with pulling together what we just heard, food, energy, water, climate, and public health, and doing all that in five minutes or less before we can get to the questions, okay? And to up the difficulty level, maybe we'll just throw in world peace too. Why not, right? So the nexus between the environment and public health has been established for quite some time now. That's why we passed environmental laws back in the 60s and 70s. Um, that's why we phased lead out of gasoline in the 80s. It's because it's very easy for people to look at uh, what's coming out of a smokestack or what's coming out of a tailpipe and saying, yeah, that affects my health. I want a law to help minimize that so I can breathe easier, right? But now we're moving into um, a phase where we are linking climate change and public health, and there's not that nice direct connection between climate change or what we're doing and health outcomes. And you know, um, as uh, Amir Sapkota has pointed out, though, that there are very real connections between climate change, extreme events, extreme stresses on our systems, and public health outcomes. It's just not as intuitive, and that's going to become really, really important, right? Because as uh, Professor Holtman has said, is that, you know, in some ways we're now in a place where we are all taking ownership of climate change and doing something about it. And that's a good, healthy place to be because in the past we have been, I think, too reliant upon, oh, we've got a good government who cares at the federal level, great. Holtman will work on it, he'll fix it, and he'll pass, you know, better fuel economy standards. I don't have to worry about it now. Let me see, now that, you know, now my, uh, my Cadillac Escalade will get 22 miles to the gallon, so hooray, right? Problem solved. No, I mean, that's not the case. And that's a, a big part of the problem we have in regulating the environment now versus 40 years ago. It was easy, in some sense, to figure out how to regulate what comes out of a smokestack what comes out of a tailpipe, right? What comes out <clears throat> of a pipe going into the Chesapeake Bay? And we've got a really good handle on that now. But climate change and the linkage to public health is not as intuitive, so there's not as much political will, right, and support. And it's also not that guy doing the problem, that owner of the factory, right, that owner of the pipe uh, coming out of the ditch, the maker of gasoline, Right? Those aren't necessarily the, the bad guys anymore. It's all of us. It's all of us, and as Professor Everhart pointed out, the choices we're making about our food, right? The choices we're making about the kind of car we drive. Those are going to be the biggest drivers of climate change moving forward. And is the world, who now wants to adopt our lifestyle, going to adopt our lifestyle circa 1980, 2000, or a lifestyle that we're about to develop as we address climate change and still want to maintain our quality of life. I think these are really big, difficult issues to tackle. They're being done at multiple levels, though, even at the federal level, right? The Obama administration's work to increase fuel economy standards has done an amazing job at reducing our greenhouse gases. We've actually increased the number of miles we've driven and decreased our greenhouse gases from automobiles. That's amazing, right? At the state level, 30 states now have renewable portfolio standards that are requiring greenhouse gas reduction through the adoption of renewable energy. Here in Maryland right now, so here is one way in which you guys can all help out. You're a Maryland citizen. In the Maryland House of Delegates right now, it's passed the Senate, stuck in, co in committee in the House of Delegates, is a bill to increase Maryland's renewable portfolio standard to 50% of our energy created for electricity from renewables by 2030, right? That's almost a doubling of what, what we had originally committed to do. And we can do it. Um, but it's stuck in committee. Contact your delegate. Get that out of committee, get it voted on, make it law, and businesses will figure out how to make money and make it happen, right? That's the beauty of the capitalist system, right? Even at the local level, so our environmental law clinic is trying to get a coal ash dump shut down in Brandywine, Maryland. We succeeded, we won, hooray for us, in part because we had an expert from the School of Public Health 
Sokovi Wilson, Professor Wilson, who testified as to the negative effects of coal ash in a big mound in the middle of a community where there's now ball fields in a park right next door, right? The county government listened, shut it down. That's creating a stress on coal-fired fi coal power plants. That's happening around the country. And we can, convert, we can get, using, using various methods, renewable energy, um, addressing the externalities of burning coal, we can get past coal fairly quickly. Great Britain, the United Kingdom did it. 2012, they had 42% of their energy uh, generated by coal. Today, it's 7%. So we're talking in a few years, the United Kingdom figured it out. We're on that same trajectory, it's just going slower. Uh, I'll leave it to you as to why that might be, but it is still proceeding. There's almost no new coal-fired power plants being developed, and um, there are many being shut down. So just another statistic for you. From 2009 to 2012, under the Obama administration, 15,000 megawatts of coal was shut down. Plants are getting old, they're being retired because they're not efficient. In 2017 and 18, under the Trump administration, 23,000 megawatts. So in half the time, you know, a lot more coal-fired power plants are being shut down, even with our federal government trying to prop them up. It's just not working, and renewables are getting cheaper, and so we are in the midst of an electricity revolution, if you will, started in part by the Obama administration. But I think the next level, as we look at how the environment, public health, and, and food production, water production, we need to rethink of sustainability, not just conserving resources, as we've heard today, but also as a way of building resiliency for the shocks to our system that are going to come, that are, we're feeling right now. Ellicott City certainly did, right? Um, and that's the way we need to really rethink resiliency by thinking how can we adapt systems to better manage extreme events. So with that, I will, let's hear, we want to hear from you now. So thank you very much. And if you have a question, if you could come on up to the microphone. So this might be a really naive question, but is there any data that suggests uh, that the meat uh, wastage is anything more or less as compared to fresh vegetables? Because meat typically, if I realize that if it is by the due date, people will freeze it, versus when you look at vegetables and fresh vegetables, as you mentioned, um, even though they're cooking it, they may not be able to freeze it or store it longer. So is there any data that suggests one or the other? That's a great question. So the question, um, in fact, um, we waste actually a lot less meat and, um, than fruits and vegetables, but the challenge is that the greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with it are so much higher from meat that actually the carbon footprint of the meat that we waste is much higher than that of the fruits and vegetables. Great question. And, and I do know that we, we are at 12 noon right now. We started 10 minutes late. so. We're, we're, going, we're willing to take a few more questions uh, that you guys may have. So I have a question not to urge you on. First of all, thank you for a fabulous um, session and the diversity of all the disciplines and the topic areas. Um, each of you could have gone really much deeper on each of these topics. So my question really has to do with training the next generation of leaders. And I know you had mentioned the uh, scholars, the Global Scholars Program. But how can we actually begin the training across our silos of our different colleges in order to understand the language, in order to sort of speak to the nexus? So if, is there a nexus certificate we can give everyone as a beginning and then move to concentrations or anything like that? I'll just, I'll just mention one thing. So we, uh, the Global Stewards Program that I did mention, it, it's currently for doctoral students on this campus, and we are uh, growing an official certificate program out of that program. Uh, it will be something to the effect of, uh, you know, transdisciplinary science and policy at the Food, Energy, Water Nexus. But we would also like to scale that program to 
our undergraduate students, our master's students, and also to our collaborators at other institutions. I'd like to hear from everyone else as well. Well, I think one of the most important things we can do, at sort of at the university level anyway, is engage our students working on real world problems. Um, so, you know, trying to address what's going on out there in the world. I mentioned uh, the uh, case that our clinic's doing, trying to shut down the Brandywine coal ash dump, right? That's an example. Through Conserve, we, uh, we, we led a trip to study water reuse in Israel and the West Bank and to see how it's different between a developed nation and an underdeveloped nation as to what that might look like. Right? It's out actually getting folks out there and engaging in the world as opposed to just sitting in the classroom. And fortunately, we've got a panel here that has engaged in the world. With, uh, and I'd love to hear more about you know, their engagement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> An excellent panel. Um, my question is on kind of the economic impact. So you were discussing the reluctance of, in terms of moving away from um, moving towards more sustainable um, energy sources. And the reluctance that I see in terms of understanding why that needs to be done and the future impact is, you know, the economies in these areas where coal, coal industries are closing down are going to be impacted. Um, can you speak to how you balance that um, the need to move towards uh, sustainable energy sources, but also to the actual real economic impact of these communities where industries are being um, shut in. So that's the question of our moment right now, and and I I'm appreciate you raising it. Um, the the. Overall, I think the, the more we understand about what um, Bill mentioned is this revolution in energy technology costs, the more we see that that's actually, broadly speaking, uh, largely a growth story, right? There's a kind of innovation, technology, growth dimension to this, what will be ultimately a, a rapid and thoroughgoing economic transition. It's not just an energy transition, it's sort of retooling how we do stuff as an economy. And, and that is largely going to be, you know, for, you know, better health, better climate outcomes, right, better economic growth as a whole. But I think that one extraordinarily interesting thing we've seen even since the midterm elections is a sort of kind of better late than never conversation that's been happening around what and many in uh, sort of pockets of, of people studying the issue of variously called just transitions or economic restructuring or, you know, uh, sometimes people are now calling it a Green New Deal, right? So the, the idea that you may or may not like the specifics of the Green New Deal that's being talked about, but the, the, the thing that I'm absolutely, uh, I think is absolutely correct is that that narrative, that discussion, is very overtly saying there are communities across this country and, frankly, in all countries that are going to be dealing with these problems that will be disadvantaged by this rapid transition, right? Like, I mean, the coal miner community is one obvious sort of area, but it's way beyond that, right? There are going to be lots of fossil-dependent communities that are going to have to transition in some way, and I think that's uh, essentially important for us in the policy world, in the world of like dealing with these organizations to think about strategies to transition. So there's a lot to say about that. I haven't given you actually any answer yet, if you've noticed. Um, the, but the, but the, the, fundamental, the fundamental issue is that A, we're talking about it now, which is actually long overdue, and B, I think there are, you know, we've handled transitions before. We changed from a pre predominantly agrarian society to an industrialized society, and like, there were hardships there. We can do better than, than that transition now. But the point is that this does happen, and we need to think very carefully. And I very much appreciate the, uh, the, the, the comment about how, as we are doing this work, we have to think about reaching out to you know, non-traditional communities in these areas that, that are going to be uh, an important part of that conversation. If I, um, if I may add to that, um, I think we also have to be very honest about it, too. Um, 
you know, the way it's, you know, framed, uh, the discussion is framed right, uh, right now, the law, uh, loss of job in the coal industry. But there's also, at the same time, tremendous amount of job generation in the renewable sector, right? I mean, that is a job created, and we need to highlight that. Um, and one analysis that I would like to uh, uh, draw here is if you are a university or if you are somebody uh, back in the 90s, uh, you know, people were use, still using typewriter, right? But if you're a college uh, student, would you train your college student in fixing typewriter or would you train them to program in the computer, right? I mean, this is the future. This is where we are heading. This is wo where the world is uh, heading. And, and by sticking our head in the sand, I think we are missing on that opportunity. The train has, so to speak, already left the station. And this is, the future is the reno renewable and energy. And we need to be honest to our communities and, and focus on how we retrain these, these communities, I mean, workers in the um, uh, mining communities, right? That's where should be, uh, that, that's what we should be having discussion about. Uh, but I don't see that, and, and that's, I think, uh, rather unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, just, just quickly picking up what Amir said, you know, it, it's really interesting, the typewriter manufacturers, right? I mean, they all went out of business. People had to move on and find other work. The coal industry right now supports 75,000 people, right? Even if we got rid of coal-fired electric power plants today, there would still be a need for coal. We needed to make steel. And actually, there's really high-grade coal coming out of Appalachia. So it's not as if something's just completely disappearing like typewriter manufacturing. But one, the size is not, this is not a huge industry employing, you know, it, it, certainly for those 75,000 people, it's a stressor and we should acknowledge that. But as Amir pointed out, far more jobs are being created than, than 75,000 in the solar energy and wind energy fields. So it's a net gain, it's a net positive uh, at the end of the day. But you're absolutely right, we need to be focused on, yes, there is gonna be local dislocation and we should do something about it, we should talk about it. Um, hi, I'm Erin Hager at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. I thoroughly enjoyed the panel. I thought it was really wonderful. Um, my background's in nutrition, and so when I heard about the labeling of the packages from the companies of sustainable, sustainably grown uh, products, my question is, of course, is this being regulated? And what does that actually mean for consumers, uh, given our experience in nutrition? Um, I mean, largely, it's going to depend on how it's labeled. Sustainably sourced um, is not something that the FDA is regulating right now. Um, so in order to figure out what that means for your individual product, the best thing to do is to go online and figure it out. Um, Coca-Cola has made a very similar pledge to General Mills. So I saw that and went, Coca-Cola? That is very interesting. How are they going to sustainably source the things that are in Coca-Cola products? Um, and went online and was, and, and was able to educate myself that way. So at this point, it's going to take some consumer homework to figure out if it's going to be worth your dollars or if you agree with their definition of sustainably sourced um, and you know, what that really means for you. We have time for one more question. Thank you for all of your information today. It's been enlightening. and. Um consciousness raising. And my question is, as a non-academician, <laughs> um, an individual in the community, um, how can we impart knowledge about um, food waste? How are we educating um, for I think with this, as with a lot of the other um, topics that have been discussed here, there's a need to um, bring this kind of throughout. So there's a need to um, bring it more into the school curricula. We actually have a curriculum for high school students about food systems and food waste. Um, and, and there's a need to integrate that into school curricula. There's a need to um, spread it through, through media, through social media, um, tips, ideas. There's also one of the things that's happening is that um, there's a new industry um, agreement on s s consistent date labels, which is great. All the like use by, sell by, there's going to be a very consistent um, meaning of them. The challenge is that even th that this new <coughs> language, there's no necessarily like, like they assume that people will now know what that means, but we don't know what that means. So there's a need for a campaign to clarify what those new labels mean. Um, and that gives an opportunity to really reach out and spread um, information as well. 
Thank you again to our fabulous uh, panelists. I've really enjoyed hearing all of your knowledge and sharing uh, your research with us. Let's give our panelists one more round of applause. And thank you all for attending the panel, and please join us throughout our afternoon sessions.